Father, we just give you praise. We thank you. Just thank you for being you. We thank you, Lord, that um, you are a rock. You are faithful. May not sometimes feel like it, but you are. Lord, as we look at your word, we ask that you will speak to us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it's Christmas. And it's always this time of year we want to look at the Christmas story. Or I hope you do. I tend to. But we're going to hopefully look at it a slightly different perspective. I'm not going to some great biblical exegesis of the, uh, of the Bible text. I don't want to do that. I don't feel that's right for this morning. I have a problem with Christmas. Ah, there you go. I've been accused of many a time by friends of being really bar humbug. Been accused by family being bar humbug. And it's true. There have been occasions in my life I have been seriously bar humbug about Christmas. Mainly on the fact that I don't like the Christmas that is advertised and instilled in us. That's where I get my bar humbug about. For me, there just seems to be this extra pressure to make this one day, the 25th of December, the perfect day. We seem to forget the other 364, or 365, if it depends if we're in the leap year or not. But we seem to want to make this one day the perfect day. The day where we're all sitting around having a lovely turkey, pulling crackers, opening our perfect presents, and the family all smiling at each other like there's nothing wrong. And people so want this perfect Christmas that it ends up generating stress, effort, financial debt, just to make this one day perfect. And at some point, I can assure you, during that day, a family row will occur. Do I hear an amen? Amen. We try and avoid it like the plague, just for this one day. I have a problem with that kind of Christmas. Now, I hasten to add, this is, please, before you think anything, this is not born out of some bad childhood experience or anything of that nature at all. This is just something I've observed as I'm an adult and I've looked around at people's lives, not just as a pastor, but in previous roles. And you can just see, you can see it in the streets, in the shops. And I hate to say this, I can see it in church with fellow Christians who, it's got to happen, got to get the right food in, got to overdo it. So I have a problem with that kind of Christmas. And then we come here at church and we'll look at the first Christmas, the Christmas we want to remember. And we try and think, oh, okay, let me focus on a proper, proper, perfect Christmas. Well, I hope you're reading the same Bible I read. It didn't look like a proper, perfect Christmas to me. So we're going to look at it probably from one person's perspective Joseph. We're going to look at that perspective. So I want you to see if you can imagine with me. You might well want to laugh along with me. You might want to cry along with me. But let's try and look at this from Joseph's perspective. O oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, O oh, come ye. Oh, hello. Welcome. I'm Joseph. I'm Joseph Carpenter at your service. Good to see you. Hello. Do I get a hello? Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Do you know, I'm betrothed to a lovely girl who I dearly love. We were engaged when we were very, very young, when we were but babies. Our, our parents put us together and said that we would eventually be married. We were betrothed about six months ago, which means in my day, we're married. 
I know for you that these days that sort of doesn't mean a lot now. You tend to not think about those sort of things too heavily in your world. But she still lives with her family at the moment. And in about another six months' time, we, we are actually going to be fully married. And she's going to come and live with me. I'm happy. Life is going great. Got a trade. Carpenter. Oh, did I mention that earlier? Currently building the marital bed. Might as well. Got the trade. Might as well do it. Saves on labour cost, doesn't it? I'm also setting it up in a home that's going to be on my family land for her to come and stay with me. Life is just brilliant. Now, she's a typical woman. She's worrying over the dress and the food and the wine. And I'm a typical bloke. I'll worry about it on the actual day when it's far too late to think about it. But I'm just happy. I'm happy because life is going well. I can't wait. I'm just over the moon that we'll be together. We can start a family. I've been waiting so long for this. And it's all there, coming now, as we speak. We love the Lord, by the way, Yahweh. absolutely love him. I go to the festivals every year. Apparently, I'm not blowing my own trumpet here, but I'm actually known as a righteous man. I'm not blowing my own trumpet. I'm quite surprised by that. I'm also a direct descendant of King David. Yes, our own King David. Me, a humble carpenter. Do you know, he was known as a man after God's own heart. He always wanted to do God's will. I want to be known for that as well. The Lord has always looked after us. We are part of the Jewish nation. God is for us. He's always got our backs. Happy days. Life is great. Ah, oh, life is on the up. Nothing's going to go wrong. I'm going to the chapel and I'm going to get married. Oh, there's Mary. Oh, here comes my wife coming. Oh, she's, oh, excuse me a minute. I just go, oh, oh, before I sit, I just want you to know something. She's the only person in the world I can trust fully. She will never betray me. She'll never do anything wrong for me. I love her so, so much. Oh, I'm going to the chapel and I'm... Turn with me to Matthew, chapter 1, verse 18 to 19. Matthew, chapter 1, verses 19... Sorry, 18 to 19. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about... His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So for Joseph, his wife, his faithful, trustful wife, had just declared that she had an angel appear and tell her that she is highly favoured. We see that in the Luke account. And she is now pregnant by the Holy Spirit. God ordained it. I bet not. And her reaction apparently was, may it be as you said. Yeah, I bet it was the smooth talker in the village next door. And she went, well, hey, I like what you're saying. Come on in. Pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Rubbish. Complete rubbish. Don't believe a word that she has just said. She has just betrayed me. My life has just taken a terrible turn. What is going on? Why has God allowed this? We've been engaged for years. We've been married for years. It was going to happen. I was building the bed. The bed that only meant for me and her. I'm a man of God. I do all the things that God prescribes of me. I love him. I acknowledge him as Lord. I rest upon him. How could she do this to me? My life was going great. How could the Lord do this to me? So after he calms down and he considers his feeling and respect for Mary, he knows he has two options. Lawsuit. 
The lawsuit is public disgrace for Mary and the potential of a stoning to death. Joseph knows that. Yeah, it's not muck about. That's absolutely true. It was that bad. Pregnant outside of wedlock, um, he would have given her public disgrace um, by making it a lawsuit, actually going to a court of law, wanting investigation to occur to find out who the man was, because he would deny, obviously, it was him. And it would lead to Mary having a stoning to death. So let's not put this under any other light other than that. Or he had a second option, which was hand her a bill of divorce, as described in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, which would be more like doing it quietly and honorably because potentially he would think of his love for Mary and his respect for her. I think Joseph is a man, a righteous man of honor to do that. Because on one level, you might go, well, that was nice and simple. He's just going to hand her a bill of divorce and walk away. But actually, for Joseph, it would have been worse than it would have been for Mary. Because the village know that they're meant to be together. So suddenly, what's going on? He's no longer with her, and she's clearly pregnant in time to come. He would have been seen quite disrespectfully. There would have been some issues for Joseph within the community. Questions asked. Shame brought upon him. So he was being really honorable in a lot more ways than we actually sometimes imagine or understand. In our big society today, it's very easy just to do things on the quiet, and the vast people you know when you walk down the street are not going to know anything about it, are they? But let's think small village mentality that we still have somewhere in this country, and think the fact that actually everybody knows everybody's business. That's what it would have been for Joseph. So I have great respect for the man who sat there considering what to do. Questions, questions, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I'm so upset. I, you know, it's going to mean so much trouble for me. So much trouble for me. But it's the right thing to do. I love her. What do I do? So, like any good bloke, he goes to sleep. Listen, I'm well known for dozing off for 10 minutes mid-afternoon. So he goes to sleep. In steps God, dream angel. Verse 20 to 23, read with me. The virgin will be with child. Am I reading in the... No, not 20. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David... Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the prophet had said through, uh, sorry, what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, praise the Lord. It's true. She didn't lie. She hasn't betrayed me. She hasn't slept around. Oh, life is slightly back up on the up. She didn't break my trust. She didn't do anything wrong. Happy days. I can marry her. I can take her to be my wife. She still loves me. Hang on a minute. When people work out the timings, when this child is born, they're going to know that clearly sex have had to have happened prior to us getting fully married. Shame is still going to come upon me. Oh, come on, Lord. What are you doing? I do your will. I do everything you ask. Oh, the embarrassment. People are probably going to think that I pushed myself on her prior to the wedding day. My reputation is not going to be very good for a while in the village. How do I get job? 
How do I get some work? Some people may not want to employ me because they want to be associated with the, you know, effectively. You know, I could be classed as a bit of a rapist or something. People might take offence at me. I've got to be really cautious. I know in your modern times here, these sort of things are seen as quite normal and part of society. Sleep together, don't worry about it. Live together, don't worry about it. But in my day, it's the most shame, honourable thing that you could do. I've... God, what are you doing? I'm going to be known as the bad boy, Joe. Not the righteous man, Joe. You've broken our law, Joe. Come on, Lord, really? Your will be done. You are Lord. You know what you're doing. That's clearly by the angels told me that. You know what you're doing. And I've just realised also something else. This baby's not going to have the family name. I mean, we, we always give the family name. And he's not. I've been told what I've got to call him. I've got to call him Jesus. That wasn't the choice I had. But I've got to call him Jesus, which means the Lord saves. Just at the moment, my reputation, that's not what it looks like to me at the moment. What are people going to think? But the Lord's will be done. The angel did say, do not be afraid to take Mary home. It can only get better from here. I'm doing the God's will. It's going to be fine. God will get it sorted. Everything's on the up. Oh, come all ye faithful. Verse 24 to 25. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Being blunt... And we sometimes don't look at this. We almost hold Joseph in this holy order way of thinking because he seemed to do everything smoothly. Please recognize the Gospels don't say, tell us lots, but there's a lot they don't say. They've been written at a time more about Jesus and more about people following Jesus and following God's will and all that sort of thing. So there's things that are missed out. So part of the way of imagining this is that we have to recognise that I know it looks like that Joseph was Mr. Super Clean Guy, but quite frankly, there was only one perfect man on this planet, and his name was Jesus. So therefore, then must mean that the likes of Joseph, etc., had normal human desires and feelings. So the fact he didn't have union with Mary, which for us, if it's your wedding night, that tends to be one of the key things at the end of the night, isn't it? Union between man and wife, yeah? Let's be real. But for him, he held himself back. But it probably dawned on him. I can't. I've been waiting years. I can't yet. I've got to wait longer. But it's important to understand that sometimes we could be on a path doing God's will and it can take a massive detour. Just because it's our dream, it doesn't mean always it's God's dream. And this giving of the name Jesus, it wasn't just that he simply named him, but it was actually also legally a formal recognition, a formal recognition that this legally is now his son. And with all the rights and authority that he can have and inherit Joseph's estate, the family estate, this is actually him formally saying, this is my son. Which is a big thing, because he is the first child, he is the first son. Therefore then, he has everything eventually that is Joseph's. Joseph gave all his rights, his inheritance, his family name, away to effectively a child that is not his own. Big thing. Big thing. Again giving up what he believes is rightly his to bestow on someone and allowing God to take it and say, God's choice where this actually all goes, not yours. Turn with me, please, can you, to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. But keep your fingers in Matthew, we will return. 
In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a censure should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Aquinas was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own home, to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Census. Leave Nazareth, travel 70 miles, 70 miles to a Judean village of Bethlehem when his wife has got to be somewhere by this point, eight months pregnant. Due to drop. Due to drop. Oh, come on! It takes a week to travel that far. No good putting on a donkey. She's that heavily pregnant, she couldn't sit straddled across the donkey. No good making her go side saddle. Because the way donkeys walk, if she falls off, she can go into early contractions while we're in the middle of nowhere. She'll have to walk it. Or we'll try and get on a car or whatever, I don't know. I bet in the future, they draw pictures of Mary in blue riding on a donkey. Give me a break. Live in the real world. This really isn't easy. And couldn't God have stopped this idea, this foolish idea of this census? He must have known about it. Couldn't he have got his timings better? Why do you have to make life so difficult for us? This is his child. I'm doing his will. Why is he making this so difficult? I know he puts people in authority, even if they're part of the Gentile nation. He says that God puts them in authority. We recognise that. So surely, why did he put this Quinas geezer in authority to call a census now? Life is not meant to be going this way. 70 miles across rugged land. Seven weeks worth. But the Lord's will be done no matter what. Verses 6 to 7. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Oh, come on. No rooms? And here's an animal feeding trough. I've got a perfectly good bed waiting back at home 70 miles away. And yet God's son, his first night is spent in an animal home. With slobber in the trough. With hay infested with lice and other funny, creepy crawlies. And not to mention the smell and the other thing that comes out that generates smell within a stable. What is God doing? He could have at least provided a room for us in an inn somewhere. I could have enjoyed some wine. What was he thinking? Again, I know I'm doing God's will apparently, but it just seems to be getting harder and harder. When's the let up coming? So far, I'm going suffering shame. I've now got this baby screaming its head off, bless it. But in this animal feeding trough, and quite frankly, I'm screaming my head off and I'm not even with it. But the laws will be done. This is his child. He must know what he's doing. But I wish he would make it easier. I really wish God would. What is his? Oh, do you know something? I wonder if they're going to come up a song later in life. You do all things well. Just look at our lives. And when they sing that, I hope some of them think, yeah, actually, just look at my life. I ain't exactly going brilliant in the moment. Where's God doing things well? But the Lord's will be done. As much as I want to keep shouting, oh, come on. What next? What next? Anyway, better look after Mary. 
Bless her, she's exhausted now. And let's see if I can try and keep some of these creatures away from the baby. Verses 8 to 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which they were just, which were just as they had been told. Oh, come on! The first visitors to the newborn are the dishonest, untrustworthy, flea-ridden, flea-bitten shepherds. Give me a break! What I want is somebody nice, somebody in society that we love, that we accept. Why would God send them? It's not bad enough from in this stinky home. He then sends the stinky carers as well. And they didn't even bring any prezzies with them. Unbelievable. Oh, they came here telling me the angels and actually they saw a whole host of them. And yes, I suppose I have to agree with that. They had to have done that. Because God sent me an angel and sent Mary an angel. And let's not forget Mary's cousin as well. There was an angel there as well. But I can understand that because he's a Levite. I oh, send these, oh, these shepherds. Oh, they weren't nasty. They came and they, they worshipped uh, Jesus, which I've got to say, if I'm honest, he's a baby screaming his head off. And I don't know why they quite did that, but... There you go. But I understand and, and, and I know that this is the Lord's baby, so I'm going to care for him and love him and do everything I can. I've got to say this, though. I'm going to check all my belongings before they go. Didn't bring anything. Make sure I ain't going to walk out with nothing. I know God sent them, but hello, where's my prize? When I'm going to feel the great joy for this moment... I'm the one doing all the work here. I'm the one who's got to be the man of the house. I'm the one who's got to sort out Mary and Jesus. I'm the one who's got to put up with some of the shame of it. I must admit, maybe I'm getting slightly tired, but it is the Lord's will. He'll keep us going. I know he will. I'm sure it can only get better after this. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Turn back with me to Matthew chapter 2. One to twelve. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people, chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. 
For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I, may, I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Ah, oh, praise the Lord. The Prezies have arrived. But from Gentiles, stargazers, wise men, the gold is good. Help with the expenses of Jesus. The Lord does provide. Do you know how much nappies are these days? And they bought some incense as well. Well, I know that means divinity, and that's great. But also the incense will help with some of the smell as well. I'm not quite sure about the myrrh, though. That means death. It's a funny thing to give to a baby. Death. Maybe they're not so wise after all. Maybe they're not used to having children. Maybe they don't understand. But this is God's child. I think there's some significance to this. But I don't fully understand. I'm just doing what God, I believe, wants me to do. I may cry out at times and think, oh, come on. And I have done on a number of occasions, I must admit. This is not an easy job. I thought this was going to be easy. I'm doing God's will. Life is going to go really well. But this doing God's will is not easy. Anyway, they're gone now. Fantastic. Life surely is only going to get better from here. That's enough. That's a lot of them. Oh, come, all ye faithful. Oh, I'm tired. Time for bed, I think. When they'd gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. He got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. So was fulfilled with the Lord and said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Oh, come on, another long journey? What's going on? Again, gee, God puts people in charge, in authority, and he's put that nutter, that evil Herod in charge. I've now got to get up in the middle of the night. We've got to travel in the middle of the night with the dangers of the muggers, the wild animals. Oh, come on, Lord. What are you thinking? What job am I going to do in Egypt? I, I know I've got my trade, but it means I've got to set up the business again. How's the Lord going to provide living quarters? And there might be some family in Egypt, actually, because actually there's a whole bunch of the Jewish nation still there. So I might get sorted, but I won't really know until I get there. Oh, well, probably the gold will pay for some of the travel, but I've still got a job. I've still got to work. And I'm not really known. They might not think my work is very good. But... The Lord does provide. The Lord is somebody who does get our backs, even if it doesn't think about it. Life surely is going to get better. And I've got to say, I've got to get going because Jesus' life is in danger. And so's Mary's. And, oh, hang on a minute, so's mine. We better get out of here quick. The Lord will provide. The Lord does provide. He does. I'll hang on to that. Do you know, I do hope in the future that people will remember the sacrifice I made. I might get called the blessed Joseph. You never know. You never know. Verses 19 to 20. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. 
I know he said he would call me back eventually, but I've just set up the business. We've settled. And now we've got to move again, back, and another long journey. I've got a client base. And I've got to return back to the family business where I'm sure there's some other carpenter that's taken over already. And I'm going to have to do it all over again and still return to the shame of the village and the family at some point and explain why I've got a child that clearly isn't mine because he looks nothing like me. I could just say, well, he looks more like his mother. But I've got to return. People are going to try and work out what is going on. I know by now people have figured out there's something to do with some, his God's son, but that still doesn't help. People get wrapped up in their own way of thinking. They get so caught up in our culture, they can't see sometimes God at work beyond their own nose. They're so self-centered and so making sure we won't be embarrassed, we can't sometimes see God at work. I bet they're going to say, oh, Egypt didn't work out then, did it? Guess what you missed? That evil monster killing all those sons. And I do feel for those families. I really do. The trauma they must have gone through. I feel for them. And I can't really say, well, God pulled us out because of this son. That will not help Jesus or us as a family. I need to be cautious about how we tell people why we moved to Egypt. Can't just be crass and say, well, it was God's will. What about the will for all those other children? Jesus is growing up fast. I do love him. But at least Herod is now dead. I can go back. God has got our back, even if it means sometimes a hard in the process. Back to the family home then. Oh, come, all ye faithful. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judah in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Oh, come on, again? What do you mean the son is now in charge? He's even more awful and evil than Herod was. What is God doing? Why didn't he keep us in Egypt? They could want to come under, after Jesus and after me. But God so far has been faithful. It's just been such a hard slog and a hard journey. I thought travelling in night to Egypt was bad enough. But now coming back knowing the nutter is actually in charge makes it even worse. I am scared. So, so scared. What do I do now? I should have learned by now that God is good and really faithful. Should have picked that up, but it just seems that each new experience brings something new that I did not know about myself. Do you know what? I need to go to sleep. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. <sighs> Home. This looking after God's own is not an easy job. This doing God's will is not easy. It surely will only get better from here. I don't know what you thought when you're coming into Christmas and you thought following Jesus would make life easy. Some of us in this room I know have go through traumas and know the hard journeys and sometimes might well start screaming out, oh, come on, when's it going to get easier? 
There are always unexpected twists and turns in our walk. There could be the giving up of a job, giving up of family, giving up of home comforts, giving up of security, the giving up of family dreams and desires, the sacrifice of one's own pleasures. You might end up having to take others on board. Somebody into your family you was never expecting to. You might well have taken on a stepson or a stepdaughter who you've loved, you've brought up, you've cared, you've fed, you've given them security. And when they're age about 12, they give you a right kick in the stomach when they turn around and say, No, 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 this is my father's house. You may do everything that the Lord asks you to do. And it's not been nice. It's been a hard slog. You haven't been appreciated. You've actually been vilified for what you have done for the Lord. And it won't be just from people from outside the church community, it will be people from inside as well, who don't always understand that sometimes there is a bigger picture than them. You may never be remembered again. Your name become disposable. Your name may well be overshadowed by others. Turn with me quickly to Matthew 14, verse 55. Did I say 14 verse? There is no such thing as 14, verse 55. Bear with me. teach me not to verify my um but it's fine i know what i want to say when when jesus is finally preaching you'll note in the gospels that when uh um he's in his hometown preaching the words are oh isn't this the carpenter's son don't we know his mother mary and then his brothers james and and the family and they list off the rest of the names it's all in the gospels joseph's name is not there He's done all of that that we've just gone through, and his name is not there at near the end. It's believed that almost when, Joseph, uh, when Jesus definitely was into his ministry or prior to that, Joseph had died. So Joseph never actually saw the final outcome of this baby whom he cared, loved, protected, did all the things that God asked him to do, but he never saw the final result of that ministry. He just did the Lord's will. You might well faithfully care and love for the good and the bad. And there are times that you will shout out, Oh, come on! And we're going to be singing those wonderful carols over Christmas, which theologically some of them I disagree with, but anyway, there you go, that's moving on. But you'll be singing, oh, come all ye faithful. And it's true. But there are times you might want to well be screaming out, oh, come on. The Lord hears those. He doesn't disagree with you. He might well turn around and say, you've got every right to do that, please. But still, my will be done. Follow me. It will take twists and turns. It will not go exactly as you planned. But it's worth it in the end. So as you shout out, maybe this Christmas, because it's not going to be the perfect Christmas, because there are problems, there is sadness. And you shout sometimes, oh, come on! God shouts even more loudly from his home to you. Oh, come, all ye faithful, Be joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye, 
to heaven for all eternity. Let's pray. Just for yourself for a moment, if something has resonated in the journey of Joseph, and I know a lot of it was imagined, but he was a real man. If some of that has resonated with you, lift it up to God now. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you first and foremost because there is different ways of reading it. It's not monotonal by a long shot. But Lord, most importantly, thank you for you and your faithfulness. And there's times that we don't feel it. We don't seem to see it. But it's very much present. Lord, I want to pray for each and every one of us in this room this afternoon. In the times that we shout out, oh, come on. We can also sing joyful and triumphantly, knowing that actually it's not about the one day. It's not all about today or Christmas Day or Easter, but it's actually about the future, the future with you. I ask you, Lord, to rest in your spirit and to settle those today that they know your peace right now in the turbulent situation that they are in, in the situation where they are screaming out, oh, come on, how's this doing your will? Help us to walk alongside those people as well, Lord, as you are walking with them right now. For some of us, Lord, where our day and these next few weeks is going to be quite joyful and triumphant, or it appears to be at the moment, Lord, if we do get a jarring shock, let us know that we can run to you. And for those of us that are going to have a joyful Christmas, Lord, let us help us remember you and thank you and be joyful with you as well. In your son Jesus, whom we love so much, we pray. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.